Welcome to another episode of The Chef Educator, the show that provides and discusses various teaching tools, tips, and techniques for the culinary, hospitality, and pastry arts educator. And now, coming to you through the airways from Palm Beach County, Florida, here is your host, doctor, professor, and chef, Mr. Colin Rowe. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Chef Educator Podcast. My name is Dr. Colin Roach, and I am your host. And we created this podcast to be a comprehensive resource for both new and veteran culinary, baking and pastry, and hospitality educators, teachers, and faculty at both secondary and post-secondary educational institutions. Our hope is to offer a collection of practical and effective teaching tools, tips, and techniques that we can all use in our classrooms and our labs. And if this is of interest, please be sure to let us know. And don't forget to subscribe and give each episode a positive rating on Apple Podcasts. It is only with your help and support that this podcast is possible. So now let's get right into today's episode where I kick off a series of shows on the subject of grading, assessment, and evaluation. In this series, I want to take a long, hard, honest, and uncensored look at the way we grade students in our schools today and how we report their learning progress. Along the way, I plan to share with you information and research from a variety of resources, and I'll include these sources in the show notes. A few of the more influential books that I want to mention right away are On Your Mark by Thomas Gusky, A Repair Kit for Grading by Ken O'Connor, and Learner-Centered Assessment on College Campuses by Mary Hubba and Jan Freed. Now, as we all know, most aspects of grading and reporting have been around forever and reflect traditions that have been a part of our educational system since the early 1900s. These traditions are entrenched in our education culture and are part of nearly everyone's school experience. I mean, think back with me to when you were in school. Think about the grades that we all got in the various classes we took when we were in grade school, high school, and even in college and beyond. Now, some of our experiences with grades were distinctly positive, especially when a grade provided affirmation of a job well done. We all love those A's. But more often than not, these positive memories are overshadowed by recollection of negative experiences that evoke feelings of disappointment, embarrassment, and sometimes shame. The research tells us that our negative experience with grades can profoundly affect us and can sometimes even be life-altering. I mean, a bad grade can derail someone from, you know, taking a certain class, from, you know, further pursuit of education, uh, even from considering a certain profession. So where do these grades come from and how were they calculated? Well, oftentimes it is from some sort of assessment. Assessment is the process and product of determining whether students have learned what they're expected to learn from instruction. And from a teacher's point of view, Anything that reveals what students are learning and how well they have learned can be considered an assessment. Now, there are different types of assessment, but the two types I want to talk about now are formative and summative. Formative assessment is used during the learning process. Its purpose is to inform the teacher and the students about how well the learning is going. Now, as teachers, we all know that simply delivering information and coming up with activities and providing opportunities you know, for our students to master learning objectives does not always result in that intended learning. Well, assessment data can help show us what skills and understanding have not transferred while also giving us indications as to where we need to focus our attention in order to close those gaps in the teaching learning process. Now we can use any format to gather that data, such as you know, an informal oral questions in class during the lesson. Or it could be something more formal, like a written quiz or an essay. Students also need to know how well they are doing, at least as much as the teacher does. And a key benefit of formative assessment is that students get this information at a point in which they can easily get their learning back on course before that big old summative assessment occurs or the subject is finished and a new unit or a new lecture or a new class starts. For both the student and the teacher, 
we wouldn't want to wait until a major test, like the final exam, to find out if a student doesn't know or understand something. Because then it's too late. We can't do anything about it at that point. It would be better to get this information earlier through the formative assessment so that then we can make corrections and do something about it. Therefore, what makes formative assessment formative is that the teacher and the students use the data it generates to shape further instruction and learning. Some teachers, however, do use formative assessment for grading, like with homework and quizzes. But with this assessment application, the real objective is to uncover and make sure that the students are informed of their own progress. This can be done through review, a teacher's comments, or some other way to show them that they are either understanding and doing well or what they are struggling with or misunderstanding. Now, most teachers are constantly assessing how their students' learning is progressing through you know, simple, natural things like when we're in class teaching, we watch their facial expressions and the student's body language. Uh, we listen to the student's comments and the questions and answers they're giving us or asking us. We read their journal entries. We check homework. A lot of things that we can do. And this, this kind of informal data gathering becomes formative assessment when we, the teacher, uses that data to inform or guide instructional adjustments within the lesson or the unit that's underway. We find out they're not getting it. Let's change the lesson plan. Let's try a different approach, a different tactic. Come at it from a different angle. Now, summative assessment, on the other hand, is designed and used to sum up learning that has taken place during a lesson or a unit or even in a course. The data it generates typically serves as the basis for a grade or it could be for a certificate or even a degree or some other you know, marker of achieved learning. Sometimes you will hear schools and some teachers use the term assessment to mean formative assessment and the word evaluation to mean summative assessment. They sort of make a distinction in that way. But basically, summative assessment is a form of final judgment on how well the student has learned and, by extension, how well the teacher has taught. See, one of the purposes of summative assessment is to help distinguish successful students, successful teachers, and successful schools from those that haven't been as successful and, you know, in the form of a rating, such as a grade or a test score. In contrast to formative assessment, summative assessment does not play a direct role in the teaching or learning process, as the time when students can improve their achievement in that unit or course is past. It's long gone. But in the longer run, summative assessment can be used to help improve learning and teaching, as when a student is in, you know, maybe inspired to try harder next semester. You know, maybe they get that D and it maybe motivates them, say, oh, i got to bring my grades up. It can also be when a teacher decides to use a new method of instruction, like they found out, wow, a good percentage of my students aren't passing or they're in the C or B level, so maybe they're going to try something new. Or it could even be when a school decides to make changes in hopes of improving student achievement. They find out, you know, a whole class, you know, is, is, is struggling, so they're going to make some changes. For example, consider state standardized tests, which are considered to be summative assessments. The scores become a permanent record of student achievement levels on the day the tests were administrated. However, these tests also function as formative assessment when the school district analyzes the resulting data to make decisions about curriculum, staff development, or other policies. In summative assessment, the theory is that the summative assessment needs to represent a valid and reliable sampling of student achievements, which then leads to a you know, a, a meaningful statement, a grade, if you will, of what that student knows, understands, and can do. Assessment, therefore, is a direct, logical step in the instructional process that is necessary to ensure that students achieve the outcomes your objectives describe. A suitable, direct, logical way to begin creating an assessment is to visualize a successful learner in your class and ask, what can the student do to show me that they have achieved the objective? Or more specifically, you could ask, what can this student say, write, or create? Or what questions can they answer? What tasks can they perform? And given this kind of thinking that the objectives describe, 
How can the student prove that they are doing that thinking? See, all of these questions are tools for identifying the most appropriate way for students to demonstrate their thinking and learning. Now, in school, objectives exist to establish what students will learn. Therefore, if we do not assess our objectives, then our students' learning, and even more so, their failure to learn, is invisible. We don't know. We need to assess to find out. In other words, if we don't measure student mastery of the objective, it doesn't really matter what the objective says or even whether it's even there. If the teacher is satisfied with merely exposing students to new information, then that is the teacher's functional objective, but that is not the same as student learning. An old saying tells us that what gets rewarded is what gets done, or another way, what gets measured is what gets done. And this is a useful reminder for us as teachers and that we need to make sure our assessments measure and reward the kind of learning that is required. And our lesson plan should ensure the connection between objectives and assessments and that all objectives are assessed and all assessments are aligned with our objectives. I'll say that again. We need to make sure that all objectives are assessed and all assessments are aligned with those objectives. We should not have a test or assignment that doesn't relate back to our course or our class objectives because then, one, it's out of alignment, and at that point, it's really just busy work we're giving the students. For example, I once knew a faculty member who taught a wine and spirits class who gave his students a research paper on well-known fine dining chefs and their restaurants. Now, he believed, truly believed, that it would be good for students you know, for the students to be aware of the trend-setting chefs out there today in our industry and, and who's making an impact. And I totally agree that students today should know this, but not in a beverage and spirits class. This assignment has nothing to do with the course objectives in that class. This assignment might be better suited to a modern cuisine class or a you know, restaurant today type class. But in the context of his class, Beverage and Spirits, it was misaligned and therefore it was not a good assessment. Okay, it is just about the halfway point in the show and I want to take a quick pause here to recognize our sponsor, The Colony Hotel, whose generous support is what helps us make this show and share it with all of you. With locations in Delray Beach, Florida and Kennebunkport, Maine, please consider their gorgeous oceanfront resort properties for your next vacation or event. To find out more information, please go to their website at www.thecolonyhotel, that is spelled C-O-L-O-N-Y, thecolonyhotel, all one word, dot com. You can also find the link in the show notes. And if anyone out there listening would like to help sponsor or support this show, we would greatly appreciate it. If you are a company, business, or service, please contact us at drprofessorchef at gmail.com or through our other contact information listed in the show notes, or you can go through the link chefeducator.com, and all of our contact information is there. Now, if you're an individual, there are two basic ways you can help support the show and be part of keeping these resources free while helping support the creation of future episodes. The first is through Patreon which we have a link set up in the show notes, as well as on all of our social media. If you contribute just the value of a coffee a month, you will be helping to support the hosting, purchasing, creation, and production of our shows, episodes, and all of the educational materials we produce and give away for free. And by supporting us, you will be an even bigger part of our community than you already are. And the second way to help us, if you can't contribute financially and have watched or listened to more than, say, three episodes, to please write a review on YouTube or Apple Podcasts, and then you can consider that your donation. And I want to say right up front, a huge thank you to all of you. You are why we do this. Okay, so now back to the show. Here are two essential questions that all educators should ask about their grades. And if you're a teacher right now, think about your own grading as I read these. Number one, how confident am I that the grades I assign students accurately reflect my school's and or district's published content standards and desired learning outcomes? And number two, how confident am I that the grades students get in my class, lab, school, and or district 
are accurate, meaningful, and consistent, and that they support learning. So what do you think? Now be honest, because in most schools and districts, the answer to these questions, especially at the middle and high school levels, range from not very to not at all. So let's break down that second essential question a little more, which indicates that effective grades need to meet four kind of overarching criteria for success. They must be accurate, they must be meaningful, they must be consistent, and they must support learning. And I think you would agree, as most teachers, students, and parents would, that these are all reasonable and necessary expectations. So let, let's take a little deeper look here. First and foremost, grades need to be an accurate reflection of student achievement. Inaccurate grades lead to poor decisions being made by and about any student whose grades are used as the basis of those decisions. When determining grades, many teachers continue the traditional practice of combining a large amount of evidence and data into a single summary symbol. This may involve literally hundreds of decisions. Think about all the things throughout a class, a term, or a school year that a student does, which is then distilled down into a single letter grade. And even if one of these is inaccurately scored, then the grade inaccurately reflects that student's achievement. And inaccurate grades most commonly result from the teacher. And one of the most common ways that this happens is when a teacher incorrectly determines them by blending achievements with behaviors, such as effort, participation, adherence to class rules. This should never happen. This has nothing to do with achievement. This is outside of the objectives. And I'm going to talk more about that. Second, grades need to be meaningful. They must communicate useful information to students, to everyone else interested in or needing to know about learning. Traditionally, teachers have collected evidence using various assessment methods, and then they organize them in their grade books by type of evidence, such as tests, projects, assignments. So the grading link to learning outcomes has been you know, tentative at best. And I'm going to talk more about how you can identify and assess using meaningful you know, grades. Third, grades need to be consistent across teachers. The grades students receive should not be a function of whether they are in Teacher X's class or they're in Teacher Y's class. The question really is, how good is good enough? And that needs to be the same from classroom to classroom, teacher to teacher. That is, performance standards need to be the same from teacher to teacher. Student achievement at the same level should get the same grade, regardless of context. And this is clearly not the case in schools where you know, some teachers are identified as hard and others labeled as an easy A. I don't know about you, but at my school, students know who the easy teachers are. And many of these students seek those teachers out and register to take the classes with them. And a student's grade should not depend on the teacher they had. This shouldn't be acceptable. It should be on what they did in those classes, and it should be standard between those teachers or between those classes, between those subjects. Okay, and last, grades need to support learning. Students and parents need to understand that achieving in school is not only about doing the work or accumulating points. We want students to understand that school is about learning and that grades are just an artifact of that learning. Students should value the quality of the learning and know that grades should only be a reflection of the student's achievement. However, when teachers assign a point value to everything students do, such as you know, simply turning in work, then the message gets blurred, and students start to believe that success lies in the quantity of points they've earned. It becomes you know, all about the letter grade or all about the score on an assessment and not about the learning that happened. Now, formative assessments are designed to help students improve, and in almost all cases, they should not be used to determine grades. Summative assessments, on the other hand, are designed to measure student achievement and are used to make statements of the status of student learning at a certain point in time to those outside the classroom. Therefore, with some limited exceptions, only evidence from summative assessments should be used when determining grades. However, with that said, we also must allow new evidence to replace old evidence when it is clear that a student knows or can do something today that they didn't or couldn't previously. 
Now, I'm going to talk much more about this in a future episode that I'm going to title Makeup Work and Retakes. And there's a whole you know, research theory behind that that I definitely want to share with you. Okay, so I want to wrap up this episode by saying that there are three underpinning issues we must consider before addressing the specifics of how to determine grades. And the three are fairness, motivation, and objectivity and professional judgment. So first, fairness. In education, we tend to think of fairness as uniformity. For example, all students are required to do the same assessments in the same amount of time, and their grades will be calculated in the same way from the same number of assessments. But we have to realize that students are different in many ways, and so treating them the same can actually be unfair. In other words, fair does not mean equal. Yet when it comes to grading, we always insist that it does. Fairness is much more about equity of opportunity than it is about uniformity. For example, some students need to wear glasses, and for equity of opportunity, they wear the glasses when they need them. For fairness, we don't say, for today's test, you cannot wear your glasses because everyone is not wearing glasses. Or we wouldn't say, well, because some students in this class need glasses, you will all then need to wear them, whether you need them or not. I mean, this would be crazy. It makes no sense. So here's a statement from a school that I want to share with you, and I think it would be awesome if more schools adopted it. Okay, it reads, All students are given an equal opportunity to demonstrate what they know and can do as part of the assessment process. Adaptions are available for students, including students with learning or physical disabilities, to allow them to demonstrate their knowledge and skills provided that the adaptions do not jeopardize the integrity or content of the test. That is great. I mean, that, this school even puts the word adaptions in bold italics in their statement to emphasize that, for fairness, adaptions should not be limited to students who have been specifically identified as needing an accommodation. For example, and more time to complete a test, but rather, adaptions are for all students the second underpinning issue is motivation. Now, grades are often extrinsic motivators, meaning that their powers to influence student behaviors derives from outside the student, right? external. Many teachers, parents, grandparents, etc., have all used grades as extrinsic motivators. They say things like, well, everyone who gets an A on this quiz can skip the next homework assignment, or, you know, famous for grandparents and parents. I'll give you a dollar for every A you get on your report card. Or even the reverse. If you don't get a B or better on the next test, you're grounded. You can't go out this weekend. You can't see your friends. Uh, so that's that extrinsic motivation, the external. However, the use of grades is not always effective or appropriate. You know, grades certainly motivate successful students, at least some of the time, but they are definitely not motivators for all students such as those who get grades that are lower than they expect or lower than they think they deserve. For these students, grades, in fact, act as demotivators. Now, many schools and districts have mission or belief statements that state their desire to develop students who are independent, self-directed, lifelong learners, or some version of that. Well, to achieve this goal, students need to be intrinsically motivated meaning that their desire to achieve and improve must come from within themselves. An intrinsic motivation is clearly in conflict with the use of grades as extrinsic motivators. I believe that not only do grades not motivate many of our students, but that they can actually damage both attitudes towards learning and relationships among students. Both in and out of school, we provide elaborate systems of rewards and punishments in the belief that this will lead to more of those behaviors deemed desirable and less deemed undesirable. But the research on motivation shows that continued use of extrinsic motivators leads to two main results. First, extrinsic motivators increases students' focus on the reward or punishment rather than on the desired behavior. And second, they give rise to the need to continuously increase the amount of reward or punishment to elicit the desired behavior. Thus, it is both ineffective and inappropriate to use grades as extrinsic motivators, either to reward desired 
behavior or to punish undesired behavior. The primary reward for learning should be intrinsic from the positive feelings that results from success. And as noted by research, those who experience success often gain the confidence needed to risk trying. Whereas students who experience failure often lose confidence in themselves, stop trying, and fail even more frequently. As it turns out, confidence is the key to student success in all learning situations. Actual success at learning and seeing oneself getting better is the single most important factor in intrinsic motivation. Therefore, remember, the best classroom practices maximize intrinsic motivation and minimize extrinsic motivation. As teachers, we need to try to help our students with the critical understanding that, you know, 20 years from now, heck, five years from now, it won't matter what grades you got, but it will matter what you've learned and how you've used it. I often tell my students that I have five degrees, yet no one has ever, ever, ever asked me what I got for a grade in any individual class. They don't care. They want to know that, one, I graduated, you know, that I made it through, and that I have the knowledge. It is not about the grades. And I tell them, yes, it's important. The grades are important for scholarships, maybe getting into graduate school, things like that. But it is much more about the learning. And I always tell them, let's say you could buy a degree or cheat your way through and get all A's. Sure, that may get you an interview and maybe even a job offer. But basically, you're a fraud. You can't do the job because you don't have the knowledge. They're going to figure it out, and you will be gone. And I usually close with telling the students, listen, you do the work, you do the learning. And that's always been kind of helpful, kind of puts it in perspective for them that don't get hung up on grades. Yeah, they're there, they're kind of important, but don't get hung up on them. Grab the learning, grab the knowledge, grab the information. Now, the last issue is objectivity and professional judgment. Teachers often say they are striving to be as objective as possible in their assessment and grading. Well, in my experience, what they most often mean is that they are trying to be consistent in evaluating student work. In fact, such a process as grading and assessment does involve subjective judgment. When you think about it, the only real aspect of learning that can be assessed objectively are things like um, correctness of factual content, like you know, if someone had a date, specific date, or spelling, or I teach a lot of math classes, calculations. But the rest is mostly subjective. Assessment themselves are designed subjectively because teachers create the assessment based on their professional judgment of what is to be assessed and how, which is a subjective process. And that is okay. We need to acknowledge this and not apologize. In fact, all scoring by human judges, including assigning and deducting points, is subjective. Therefore, the question is not whether it is subjective, but whether it is defensible and credible. For example, the AP, Advanced Placement, and even the IB, an International Baccalaureate, assessments are subjective and yet credible and defensible. Thus, the real issues are accuracy and consistency more than objectivity versus subjectivity. Therefore, we need to develop approaches to help us, as teachers, both assess and grade more accurately and consistently. One key to accomplishing this is a shared understanding of performance standards. In other words, an agreement on how good is good enough. And for this, we need to talk to others who teach the same subjects, the same classes as us. Grading should not be a private practice. It should be a shared practice. There should be agreements. Now, there are a few things that distort grades, which I will be talking about in future episodes of The Chef Educator. But here is a sneak peek at a few of the specific grading practices that distract from achievement, and I will be discussing later, as I mentioned, in length. For example, don't include student behaviors like effort, participation, um, adherence to class rules when you do your grading. And this includes attendance. Attendance has no place in our grading. Only include achievement. That's a big one because most people have some kind of participation grade or, you know, disciplinary grade or attendance grade or how hard they tried really shouldn't be in there. And you stay tuned for a future episode on that. Another one, don't reduce the grade on work that's been submitted late. Instead, provide support for the learner. 
I mean, they did the work. They fulfilled the objective. We should be happy about this and not penalize the student. Another one, don't give points for extra credit or use bonus points, especially if it has nothing to do with the class objectives. I mean, this just drives me crazy. When my oldest son was in high school, his teachers used to give extra credit for crazy things like bringing in a box of Kleenex or, or hand san sanitizer, since I guess the administration didn't provide it or they didn't have money in the budget. And he also, they used to, he used to give extra credit if, he, if the students didn't use their bathroom passes during the term. Like, you know, you had so many times you could go to the bathroom, but if you didn't use them, they gave you extra points. That's crazy. One, you got to go to the bathroom, use it. But two, it has nothing to do with achievement. Why are you even building that into the grades? I mean, that's just ludicrous. And I had to have a talk with a couple of those teachers. Another one, don't punish academic dishonesty with reduced grades. Apply some other consequence. Send them to judicial or whatever department is appropriate. Uh, maybe at the secondary level, you call their parents. Yes, academic dishonesty is bad, but their dishonesty has nothing to do with their achievement of the objectives. So that should not be in the grade book. Like, oh, they, they plagiarized, so I'm giving them a zero on the report. No. And this brings me to one of my all-time pet peeves. Don't include zeros in grade determination when evidence is missing or as a punishment. And this happens all the time. Teachers do this. Use some alternative. I like to use I for incomplete or insufficient evidence. Um, entering a zero is providing a numeric value to something that has never been assessed and therefore has no basis in reality. Not to mention that a zero represents an extreme score on traditional grading scale and its effect in the grade is therefore always exaggerated with disproportionate uh, effect. And really, students can never get out of it once they get that zero in there if you're using averages. This is also why I recommend that you don't rely on the mean when you're doing your grades. Consider other men measures of central tendency. Use professional judgment to see you know, where the student is. And again, I'll have a whole episode on that. I could talk about that alone for an hour. Okay, so as I mentioned, I have future episodes dedicated to these topics, so be sure to subscribe so that you are alerted when they drop. And another way to get more information is to check out the book titled Culinary Educators Teaching Tools and Tips, which is published by Kendall Hunt. I wrote this comprehensive resource with my co-authors specifically for both new and seasoned culinary and hospitality educators. Written in an easy-to-understand format, the book has numerous charts, templates, and examples throughout, and it's also available in both electronic and hard copies. Again, the book's title is Culinary Educators Teaching Tools and Tips, and it can be purchased on Amazon or through the publisher's website at www.kendallhunt.com. K-E-N-D-A-L-L Hunt.com. And I'll put a link in the show notes which uh, so you can click on it that way. And also you can go to my website, ChefRoach.com, ChefRoach.com. And in there you'll see there's a, a link uh, or tab to my book and some other resources for you. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of Chef Educator. Until we meet again, keep learning, keep teaching, and keep cooking. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye now.